For those of you that don't know me, I'm Jeannie No Carlisle, and we welcome you to the Scott County Heritage Center and Museum this evening. First, we're going to talk a little bit about Scott County before we begin on Finley Township, because Finley didn't become a township until 1867, so we've got to become a county first. I do want to thank uh, numerous people for helping me with this project, uh, including my own family and a lot of copyright material I've been able to use that I received permission to use it. And we're going to discuss in these five weeks uh, different information about where Albion, Alpha, Centerville, Concord, Day, Finley Crossroads, Gamus, Griswold, Holman, Jersey, Justice, and Sunnyside were at one time. Uh, also where State Road 1 existed Kibbe's Road, where the Mother of God Catholic Church was located, where the Opera House was in Scott County. I doubt if very many of you uh, knew about the Opera House, where churches met prior to having their own buildings, and it wasn't in just homes, where a large train robbery occurred, which most of you probably have already heard about, but we're going to hear more about that later. Did you ever wonder who built those stone uh, bridges in Lexington? We'll find out who that was and what caused the first jail in Scott County to burn. That's an interesting story. It wasn't just a fire. Where the second chartered lodge in the state of Indiana is located and most importantly where the gold is buried in Scott County. Enough to buy the state of Indiana. In 1896, who was the wealthiest man in uh, the state? He lived here in Scott County. The cemetery that had three tornadoes go through it. Uh, there were, who wrote February the 28th, 1861? I think this is very interesting. But Abraham Lincoln takes his seat in the White House next Monday, the 4th of March. That's all right, I am sure. Who received a pardon from the Confederates that lived in Lexington Township? He has relatives today here. Do you know where, how many recorded soldiers died during the Civil War in Scott County? Did you know that we had Civil War soldiers that died in Andersonville Prison? We have two Confederate soldiers buried in Scott County cemeteries. We'll find out who those people are and which cemeteries. That Scott County also had two trains that ran straight into each other and, of course, wrecked. We'll find out about that. The Vienna Westport Road. Not many people know where that is. And do you know where Westport is located? I just about told you the answer on that one. <laughs> do you know what reason a lady would have to stop teaching at the time at a time in her life? And it wasn't because she became pregnant. What common factories were throughout the county in the 1800s? Where is Split Stump, Indiana? The name of a group of Native Americans that lived at Split Stump. Austin had two brothers that were doctors, and their descendants are still here today. Who was the first pioneer at Lexington? And the answer is going to surprise you. It's not who we typically, typically think. Who lived in the poor asylum? An old trolley car was in Scottsburg, and what was it used for? And did you know there was a hanging at the courtyard? The tree is now cut down, but We'll learn more about that. And turkeys had to walk to go to market. Churches had fundraisings, which were uh, where they'd make a quilt, but it wasn't for selling the quilt. We'll explain how that was done. Why were railroads sued so frequently? And a brick kiln was in Scott County, in fact, in Scottsburg. We'll talk about where that was, and you can still see uh, some of the site of it today. Who was Leota named for? We'll find that out tonight. And what are the knobs? Especially younger ones may not realize what the knobs are. And why is Old Ox Primitive Baptist Church called Old Ox? We're going to find that out tonight. And some of you will know this, but where is the only covered bridge in Scott County? And these are some of the questions that we plan to answer in the next five Tuesdays. 
and we hope that you will be able to remember all the answers and you'll be able to do trivia questions anytime. <laughs> During the Revolutionary War first on Scott County, Henry Hamilton was appointed by the, as an English commander at Detroit and upon advice from Lord George Germain, the English war minister, he was furnished arms and ammunition as well as suitable leaders to the Indians. Their orders were included keeping a close watch on the Ohio River and destroying all the Americans that tried to pass. Now that was occurring right here. During the 1778, 107 prisoners and 110 scalps were brought to Detroit for which the British paid the Indians. George Rogers Clark from Virginia traveled down the Ohio with a party of Virginians towards Kentucky. We will learn more about George Rogers Clark when we talk about Lexington Township later. The Northwest Territory was all this area north of the uh, Ohio River and west, east of the Mississippi, all the northern part and up around Canada. You can see some of the information here on the maps. Uh, we started here with 1800 and we go on down and it shows where the Indian lands uh, are located. It shows how the county was formed and our county continued to change until 1840. Now the Northwest Territory was uh, created uh, out of as many as five states from the northwestern portion of the Ohio Valley on lines originally laid out in 1784 by Thomas Jefferson. And this was, and this also went up above the Great Lakes. And the ordinance defined the boundaries of the states, excluded slavery, and required that 60,000 inhabitants be present for statehood. So General Arthur uh, St. Clair was appointed its first governor. The territory was organized into the present states of Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, and Wisconsin. Clark's grant will be included, as I said, in uh, Lexington Township talk because that's where the Clark's grant really comes up and shows the point. We won't even go into showing you the map of that yet. In 1800, the Clark's grant section was the only part that was in a county. That was Clark County. At first, this, not even this area was in Knox County at first. Then the southern, southeastern part of Scott County became Clark, and then we were still Indian land in this area. But as time goes on, we just continually get into the state of Indiana. In, 19, in 1800, Scott County was a small part of Knox County. In fact, Knox County was the only county in what is Indiana today because that was the first county. But then a lot of that, the state was Indian Territory. In 1810, that's when Clark County became a county and it extended as far north to Jay County and as far east to Dearborn, Dearborn Born County in near Ohio. Harrison was to the west and Knox to the west of Harrison. They just kept narrowing down the uh, size of the county, Knox County. Scott County became a county in 1820 from Clark, Jackson, Jefferson, Jennings, and Washington. And you will find census records there on the right, that, or well, on my right, that were taken in 1820 that shows the different people that lived here in Scott County. 1830, there was a small section still in Jefferson County that was changed over to Scott. In 1840, almost all of the changes had been made. Anything major had been made. You'll find on the back table we have some uh, different handouts and th this is one of the maps that will is to be handed out. It's an old map of Scott County but and it shows a little bit of the Lexington Platte and the Scottsburg Platte. But, and I could not find a Finley Platte. I don't know that Fli Finley Township was ever platted. Now, Scott County's namesake was... Uh, not uh, who a lot of people think it was. Uh, we won't discuss too much about it due to lack of time, but General Charles Scott, for whom Scott County was named, he was born in Virginia in 1739. As far as we know, he never came to Scott County, Indiana. In 1808, he was elected the fourth governor of Kentucky, and he died in October 22, 1813, and we weren't even a county when he died. 
but evidently somebody thought enough of him that the Scott County should be named for him. He, uh, I'll show you his picture here. He's sort of homely, but I don't know of any direct <laughs> descendants right now. But uh, he was a Jeffersonian Republican, 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 and his term was from 1808 to 1812. He uh, was born in 1739, died in 1813, and he was a farmer, a miller, and a soldier. And everything I've always been told, uh, we just had so much respect for his style of being a soldier that that's the reason we were uh, named our county by him. And here is his picture. And if you all think that's a real handsome man, that I'm glad you do. But that's what the guy that's our namesake looks like. You'll find also some plats back in the back, uh, or patents, not plats, uh, for land. John Finley, I've made copies of these, so if anybody wants to pick any up, they can. John Finley, uh, James Finley, Weston uh, Finley. I did find out Weston C. Finley's middle name was Clay. So I suspect that John C. Finley may be John Clay because Weston is his son. But that information's on the back table also, and you can feel free to take whatever you want. Also, the newspapers in Scott County, I have that information on the table in the back. And the Genealogical Society has a lot of the Scott County uh, Journal back there in their room that if somebody wants to research. There's other information back there on historical materials, where to the groups are, when the groups meet, and websites, and you can pick that up. Now we'll start on Finley Township. Now I have one piece of paper here we're going to hand out in a few minutes, pass around to everybody. You all will be... Jeff is the only one that has seen it outside of my family. We just found it last week in some old papers. I'm excited about showing you. He said we could pass it around if everybody is very cautious with it. It's in this, and I'll pass it around. Is it uh, written in 1863? But first we'll talk about Finley Township was cut off from Vianna Township in 1867. Now this was after the Civil War or the Rebell War of the Rebellion. Finley was named after John C. Finley, an early pioneer that came here from Kentucky. Weston Clay Finley, his son, as I've already told you, was recruited as captain of a company in the Union Army during the War of the Rebellion. One trivia note that you may want to know, uh, in Finley Township in the year 2000, there were 536 houses. Now we know there's a lot of new houses being built uh, for the beautiful scenery, I'm sure. And uh, I'm sure it totals a lot more than 500 and some. Morgan, General uh, Morgan came down through uh, Finley Township, down the Finley Hill, and uh, come right through Leota, which was still Finley Crossroads at that time. And uh, they stole horses. They stole uh, animals. They forced people to cook for them. They stole money, they stole about anything they could, and then when the Union soldiers came by to try to uh, capture them, they in made all the people cook for them and do what they needed, and they, they didn't really steal it from them, but they insisted they do it. So it's just about the same thing. But eventually, the state of Indiana reimbursed these people that filed for, that, uh, for their... Uh, losses that they had during Morgan's raid. Um, Morgan's soldiers traveled east through Finley Township and reached Vianna on July the 10th. And more about this raid will uh, be talked about when we have Lexington and Vianna. General John Hunt Morgan, and I was supposed to have a picture here of him, uh, but I imagine most of you have seen him before. But uh, he wasn't even supposed to come into Indiana but he decided to go ahead and come in and raid. But it's really the only contact we had with the Civil War, uh, being anything fought on our grounds, and it really wasn't fought. He just came in and took over. One story about the raiders was the residents of Finley Knob area covered the road with felled trees when the news of Morgan's raid uh, sped ahead of his arrival while he was in Salem, tearing up, burning, 
looting, doing all the terrible things that they did. And the people were scared. Um, I would be scared if somebody said somebody's coming through like that now. So it was very disturbing. There were plenty of soldiers, but they were all in Indianapolis. Well, back at that time, especially, Indianapolis was a long ways off. So especially if you go by horseback. The residents didn't know what they could do, so they hastily cut down trees across the road so that the people could, uh, they would slow them down some. One of these stops was a very steep section behind the Leroy Gross home in the 1970s, and now the present road goes in front of that home and is less steep. But the raiders came finally, and when they did, they just cut the trees out of their way and came on through uh, Finley uh, Crossroads and until they reached Vienna that night. They did leave one guy that was wounded uh, in the area, and I haven't been able to find out anything about him. I don't know what the people did with him, if they doctored him and sent him back home or who he was or anything. I would like to find out, though, if anybody knows. So this reimbursement that's being passed around, I hope you all enjoy seeing something that original as I do. But what it says, if you have trouble reading it, I typed it out, is Lexington, July 20th, 1863, the government to Jessamine G. W. Trailer, clerk of the Scott Circuit Court, swearing claimants to description of horses and other property taken by General Morgan and Hobson commands during Morgan's raid in Indiana. 272 affidavits, certificates, and seal to claim made against the government, 30 cents each. So if you had a claim for a horse, you were supposed to get 30 cents for a total of $81.60. They also uh, charged for swearing the 36 witnesses on the applications for the horses reclaimed. About the General Morgan with original paperwork on Lexington Township, there are more records. We're going to show you original uh, records when we talk about Lexington and about Vienna. And additional information will be given at that time. And we will also find out what those worn out horses they left here, what happened to them. Uh, you'll be, I think you'll be surprised about that. We found some more original papers on that. This trail has been marked also, as many of you know, and you can take the tour anytime you'd want. It's a self-guided tour and you just drive along through southern Indiana and on up through Ohio to see, go to travel, George, oh no, to travel uh, Morgan's raid route. The roads in Scott County, these were developed from old Indian trails and old animal trails, like the Buffalo Trace. Um, these, there just wasn't roads the way they are now. A lot of you will realize that, but the younger people, I think, won't even realize that back in the 1950s and 60s, we still drove some roads and down through a creek. There was no bridge. And uh, we had some roads like that over by our house. And it was always kind of a treat to get to go drive down through there. But if it was raining very much, you couldn't go. It was too, uh, it would be too much water. But there's several roads and lanes in Finley Township. Some of them are also Big Ox, Bloomington Trail, Boatman, Brownstown, the Buffalo Trace, Carlisle, Cincinnati Trace, Caldwell, Comer, Cooley, Fairview, Finley Firehouse, Kibbe's, and some of these roads are the same name for, I um, mean, like if it's Kibbe's and like Cincinnati Trace and all is the same road as uh, the roads that go through now. Leota Viana, Leota Road was one time called Leota Viana, Liberty Knob, Mallard, McDonald's Ferry, Brownstown State. Now that was a good name. Oak Hill, Pine Ridge, Valonia Trail, Thomastown, Zion, and of course State Highway 56. Now of course I didn't name them all. Then we had uh, several creeks and rivers. Well the only river in Scott County is Muscatatuck and it divides us. But uh, the Indian term for the Muscatatuck River was the land of winding waters. The Big Ox Creek was named for Delaware Indian Chief Big Ox. That's what the settlers called him. Um, so that's how come 
things around the western area of Scott County is a lot of big ox. Cooney Creek was named for Coonskin John Ritchie because he wore a coonskin cap a lot longer than the other people, when the other people had quit doing that. Uh, so they named that creek Cooney Creek. We, of course, have Pigeon Roost Creek, uh, Swing Brook, Sticky Run, uh, Town Run, Zion Run. And creeks years ago were a lot deeper than they are now. Uh, we, you, uh, they could take a flatboat down a creek a lot of the time. I have not been able to find a plat for Leota or Finley Township. Finley, Finley Crossroads later changed to Leota, where today there is a covered bridge, and it was completed in May of 1995, which I, mo I know most of you are aware of. This is the only covered bridge in the state of Indiana that the center of it is at an X for the road, and it's the only one built since 1923 in the state of Indiana. This was built by a guy that used to go to school at Leota, and he's now a bridge maker. Leota was named after Matthias Maston and Ruth Mount's two-year-old daughter had died of diphtheria. And, well, um, Matthias had wanted to, it was always called Finley Crossroad, and Matthias had wanted to uh, have a post office. He was worried about people going to Vienna, bringing the mail back, and taking it to his general store, and he applied to the government to get a post office. They said, no, not until you name the town. So that's how come Leota was named. He named it after his little two-year-old daughter. Now, I do not know why Finley Crossroads was not sufficient as a name, but that's what the government told him. Another community that I'm not sure about is Stansberry's. The only reason that I found this was in 1845, I found a trustee's record in the recorder's office about Mount Pleasant Methodist Episcopal Church was forming, and it was talking about from Stansbury's community. Well, I had never heard of Stansbury's community, but a Mr. Stansbury was the gentleman that was trying to get this church formed. So possibly in the northern section of Finley Township, there was a community by that name. It was up near Thomastown, though, which was a sawmill village. And um, I'm, I'm still not sure. I still have more researching that I need to do on that. But perhaps it, they just called it that. I don't know. Leota has a sign that says, Population, five people, one cat, one dog. Cat and dog population may change daily. <laughs> so, and you can see that sign. <laughs> Houses were made out of logs, and they were the first homes usually built by the pioneers with usually just one room and a loft and a little house out back, which was the outhouse. Later, the log houses were built larger, but still logs. Later, farm homes were built that usually had two floors and with four fireplaces and four rooms. These would be wood frame or brick and still had the little house out back down the path. Families usually had more children than they do today, but they normally had larger barns than their houses. Now look at a lot of our houses. Much bigger than what we really need, but we like the spaciousness. The churches of Bethel Baptist Church was organized in 1835 by Reverend Joshua Cummings. On that property that the church sets, it originally was owned by Zacchaeus Sutton. Clark's Chapel was Methodist Episcopal Church and built in the early 1800s. We'll talk more about that as I talk about New Chapel. Fairview Christian, original owner of the land, was Nicholas Nunnemaker, and in 1880, Elder Thomas Jones of Little York was preaching at Poverty Point School just west of Underwood. During the fall and winter, during the spring and summer, he preached in a grove of trees just south of the present church. In 2005, a new church is being built there at this time, just north of the present church, and I understand they're going to tear the old church down. It is getting in pretty bad shape. We stopped out there the other day. The Leota Christian Church. Leota had two churches. Built around 1890, north of the Mount Store and Post Office, nearer to the crossroads. In 1903, the building was sold and turned into a country store by Robert Shields, and he 
I had traveled to Louisville and bought a storefront, a metal storefront, to put in front of that church to make his store. New Chapel Methodist Episcopal Church was originally Clark's Chapel. At one time, New Chapel moved within a quarter of a mile of Fairview. But by 1905, it was about dead. The congregation moved the church back to the site where it is today, and later in time, the building was covered with bricks. Mount Pleasant Methodist Episcopal Church, which is up at Thomastown, um, I found a recorded item the other day about appointing the trustees, and it says, pursuant to 10 days provisions notice, which I suppose they had to do to make it legal, we the citizens of the neighborhood of Stansbury's met on the 11th day of February in 1845 for the purpose of electing trustees for the Society of the Methodist Episcopal Church in said neighborhood called Mount Pleasant Meeting House. The meeting being organized by calling J. Stansbury to the chair and appointing C.B. Jones, secretary, then proceeded to ballot for five trustees for said society. And on counting the votes, the following persons were duly elected. John Stansbury, David Johnson, Stephen Johnson, Richard Ferguson, Jesse Cooley, whereupon the meeting adjourned, signed in behalf of said meeting by John Stansbury, President. On February the 12th, 1845, this was record recorded. John Moon had entered the land where the church was located. When I say entered the land, that means he was the one that has the pat had the patent on the land to get the uh, patent in the original state from Jeffersonville. The church burned and was moved across the road, and in 1890, that one was also destroyed. Old Ox Primitive Baptist Church, also called Ox Fork Regular Baptist Church and Ox's Fork, is on the branch of Big Ox Creek called Little Ox, a tributary of the Muscatatuck River. Organized in 1823 with charter members Hector Sparks, James Charles, Daniel, Polly, and Rebecca, and Eli Stark, Annie and Samuel McClary, and Elizabeth Starr. Now, Old Ox isn't used any longer, but they have some special reunions to be held there. And then the cemeteries in the back. Mount Zion Church, I haven't found any history on it. And if anybody tonight is a member of that church, I would like to speak with you. The cemeteries. There's a lot of cemeteries in uh, Finley Township. But you couldn't take the deceased very far back years ago, so you had to go by horse and wagon. So, it, you know, it was a good idea not to have it too far away. The Alsop Cemetery is right off of Alsop Road. Uh, I'm... I assume that most of you know where the Alsop Cemetery is, but it's just a quarter of a mile south of the Leota Road. And it's sort of hard to see. It's just right there to the left on the east side. So if you just drive down through there, you'll, if you'll look closely, you'll find it. There used to be an iron fence enclosing the cemetery, but I don't believe there's any part of that left. Bennett Cemetery was two miles northwest of Leota. William Bennett owned that land. Bethel Baptist Church Cemetery, we all know where it is. The original cemetery is north of the church, though. And that property, property belonged to John H. Hamilton. Clark's Chapel, New Chapel Cemetery, uh, is south of where the school was located. There was a Clark's Chapel school, or New Chapel, on the east side of the Bloomington Trail Road. This cemetery has been cleaned and fenced and gravel walkways, it really looks nice today. Fairview Christian Church Cemetery was on property that belonged to Joseph and Sarah Collins. And it belongs to that cemetery. That property belongs to that cemetery today, right there where they're building the new church in front of it. John Finley Cemetery is on the Old Salem Road, a quarter of a mile west of Liberty Knob Road, on the south side of Leota to the Salem Road on a low, a low knoll. Mount Pleasant Cemetery is on Zion Road, and it's just south of Thomastown. And the cemetery is nice and neat, and that's a, just about the only uh, thing that would make you think there was ever a church there. So that's to me, is sort of sad, but uh, it is still used some today. Not too often, but every once in a while. 
That property was entered by John Moon on January the 21st, 1839. Stark Cemetery is on land originally entered by Dr. John Ritchie on December the 9th in 1836. It is on an abandoned road winding along a ridge top which comes out on Taylor Road. It is high on a point surrounded by Virginia pines. I'll have some pictures you can look at later on cemeteries and various other things here that I have. Uh, I, we didn't have the room to bring as many pictures as I had wanted to. I guess I was going to fill the place up. I don't know. But uh, there were 11 one-room schools in Finley Township, all wood frame. Around 1910, that's when the state of Indiana decided all schools need to be made of brick. And uh, they started changing a lot of the schools and building these little brick one-room uh, schools. Their school number one was located on Little York Road and also called Jones's number one. School number two was just off the Little York Road and was called Brody School, or Brody, whichever way you want to pronounce it. School number three, or Carlisle School, was just off of Highway 56. And this Carlisle School is not, re we're not related to this group of Carlisles. Uh, my husband comes from Kentucky. <laughs> School number four was located by the Bennett Cemetery and near Zion Church and known as Ailey School. School number five was located in Leota and faced to the north. School number six was located on Taylor Road, then moved to the south end of the triangle on the hill south of Leota. It was then called Leota School. In 1953, a new consolidated school was opened and the old building torn down. The Finley Township School operated until 1985, at which time the school district number two decided it should close and be consolidated with Vianna. It was torn down and the property reverted to the Ritchie family and it has been since donated to Bethel Baptist Church. School number seven was located adjoining the Stark Cemetery. School, and you will find a lot of schools and cemeteries were together. School number eight was called the New Chapel School and burned in the late 1920s and was rebuilt. School number nine was called the Ray School. School number 10 was on the far west boundary of Finley Township. And school number 11 was Hard Scrabble School down on Collins Road in the Collins family. Matthias Mount was issued a teacher's license in 1865. Remember, he's the guy that named Leota. March 1882, a William T. Seaburn had been elected to teach the Fairview School. Now, you will find that a lot of women, when they started teaching, uh, they were allowed to teach until they got married. Once they were married, they could teach no longer. Now, I really think that's strange, but that's the way it was. Now, some of the businesses from the past and the present in the Finley Township area, there was an apple orchard and fruit drying business. And this apple orchard also, there was pears also I found out later, back roads antiques, <clears throat> a barbecue restaurant on County Line Road. Some of you may remember some of these places. Burt Dean's Grocery Store and later with partners Gene Kelly and Bob Dean. And they also ran a Huckster route. Now, for the younger people, they'll probably not know what the Huckster was. That was just where you drove a wagon around with produce and uh, different supplies out of a country store on to sell to the farm people. A lot of times when you would sell things, it really wasn't selling, you were bartering, which meant that you were trading the eggs for a chicken or whatever that they had to sell. Bert uh, Dean purchased the Silas Monroe business and built across the road. He had gas pumps, later sold to Virgil Hopper and then to Finley Fire Department and converted into their headquarters and used partially as a community building. Several of the 4-H club meetings have been held there. Bill Woodruff was a veterinarian on Highway 56. There was a blacksmith shop and grist mill owned by Marshall Davis. He also manufactured wagons and buggies. Rolla Ritchie's father also had a blacksmith shop in Leota. Bob Stevens had a gun shop out on Harry Strauss's place. There was Brisha Burr's Plumbing. Charlie Mount's gas station, later in the same building, 
Simler's Ice Cream Shop, later sold to Leon Elliott on the north side of the highway. Caldwell's Tax Service, owned by Bruce and Pearl Caldwell. Glenn Comer and Floyd Comer Auto Repair, later sold to Carl Cox and eventually to Kelly and Dean Car and Farm Equipment Sales. Country Store, owned by Larry and Betty Robbins. Diamond Care Orthopedics Incorporated, owned by Joe and Debbie Everhart. Dorothy and Earl Bridges had Imperial Marge, uh, Imperial Margin, Imperial Marble, and it was sold and moved out of the township. Dr. John Ritchie's office, and Dr. Ritchie studied herb doctoring and raised herbs to treat his patients. We have one of his uh, descendants here tonight that I was been looking back at. Garage, there was a garage owned and ran by Glenn Comer and Floyd Comer, and later it was sold to Carl Cox. There was another vet veterinarian in earlier times, Henry Austin. A hog operations today are Lucky Rose, Cheryl Miller, and Bobby Comer. Hopper's Grocery, located where Finley Firehouse is today. A horse farm operated by Chris Hancock, where Woodruff's Veterinarian Clinic was. Huckster Rab Wagons ran from both stores. J&J &J Feed and Farm Supply, owned by Jim Brody. Kelly and Dean Equipment, I'm sure a lot of you remember them. Leota Canning Factory. Canning factories were all over the county because that was one way of uh, taking care of the produce and it was a way of making some money. It was owned by George Gardner, C.C. Wolf, and Roy Miner. It was later sold to Morgan's. Leota General Store now is only open for special events or by appointments. It was owned by Robert Shields, Jim Ritchie, C.M. Ritchie, Glenn Comer, and H.E. Ware. The store had been on both sides of the road. The building there now was built in 1939 to 40, and the old store was torn down in the 1980s. There was Log Cabin Antiques. Uh, it's not there anymore, but it was run by Vernal Martin. Uh, there was a maker of chestnut roofing shingles. Morgan Trail Antiques was run by Imogene Gross. Mount's Grocery Store, and as I told you earlier, people would pick up the mail at, Le uh, at Vienna and bring it back to Leota for people to come in and pick up their mail. Pud Hobbs Barbershop, Robbins Christmas Tree Farm is there today. And John and Sharon Robbins own that, and Sharon has a reindeer shop in season. Probably nobody else in southern Indiana has that. <laughs> Robbins Nursery and Christmas Tree Farm by Kelly and Danny Robbins. Rock and Saddles ran by Roger Nichols. R there was a rooming house. You had to have rooming houses for these workers coming to work at the Leota Canning Factory. And the canning factory opened in August the 1st, 1903, and then it was sold in 1909. A sawmill operated by Cap Riley and a portable sawmill ran by Dwayne Sears. There was a sawmill up at Thomastown that blew up and killed a Mr. Miranda. Scottsburg Fertilizer, Fertilizer had several owners. Silas Monroe's gas station, Steve Trebue's auto body shop. There was a sugar and syrup camp. Tex and Joe Murphy's family sign business. And of course, the United States Post Office which was from August the 8th, 1884 to 1901. Then there was also a shoe cobbler. Everybody had to have a shoe cobbler. A midwife was there. And of course, numerous farms. Most of the ancestors were farmers. And there was one uh, lady that noted that one special farm that she could remember was the black raspberry farming on the hillside. And they hired many children or young people to come and work. Now, the gypsies came down through Finley Township, through Leota, on their way to Vienna. We'll talk about the trouble they got into when we get to Vienna. But for the younger people, I don't know if you know about gypsies, but gypsies were pretty common years ago. I wanted to tell you a little bit about what was going on in different periods of time. And like, for instance, on March 1882, the farmers were sowing their oats. In July 1882, blackberries are selling for 15 cents a gallon. New wheat is selling for 90 cents a bushel. The corn crop begins to be more encouraging. No uh, November 1882, the farmers inform us that the pumpkin crop is very slim this year. 
Farmers would jump in and help each other to get their crops out or in if necessary. If somebody became ill, your neighbors came and helped you. Threshing was a big deal. The women would all get together when the threshers come, cook a great big meal, and the men got to eat first, then the women, then the kids. July 1952, an ad for Morgan Packing Company states, wanted green field corn. We are now paying $23 per ton for green field corn delivered to our Franklin, Edinburgh, Columbus, Brownstown, and Scottsburg factories. We will continue buying field corn until our sweet corn receipts are sufficient to operate our factories to capacity. The field corn must be in the tender milk stage to be suitable for canning, the same as you would use on your table. Now, how many of you remember we used to eat field corn? We didn't have such things as sweet corn. You just go out in the field and get it. Farmers would raise corn, oats, and wheat for their own use to eat, to feed to their animals, and to barter with others, as I told you earlier, to trade for other foods. Eggs, fruits, and vegetables would be bartered at the country general store for other items. Excess animals and grain would be driven by foot or on horseback to the Ohio River to ship to other areas of the country. A ferry would take you across the Ohio River into Louisville. There weren't any bridges. After the railroad was built, animals and grain were shipped by train. Bartering was a way of life to the farmers and to others because there wasn't a lot of money. Lots of the time when seeing a doctor, he would be paid by produce or a chicken. Country stores would have fresh fruits and vegetables, eggs, chickens, fabric, threads, rabbits, hides, and any other items that the people needed. If you wanted to travel to Scottsburg in 1882, Suspensky, and it's Suspensky, not Shuspensky as we call it nowadays, and Steinberg and Scottsburg were paying highest cash price for all wool delivered at their store, or will exchange stocking yarn, jeans, and etc. at the lowest figures for the same. Can you imagine having to gather your own age, eggs, grow your own yeast, milk the cow, make your own syrup, grind your own wheat, and make your own butter in order to have pancakes for breakfast? The women would make their own dye, and to dye fabric, make their own yarn and fabric, do the laundry in a big tub on an open fire outside, a washboard was used to scrub the clothes. Soap was made of lard or beef tallow using water and lye. This is a dangerous process, but I still make it sometimes, just for the fun of it, I guess. You do not have to let it, you do have to let it age, though, if you do make lye soap, because if you don't let it age, it's uh, got too much lye in it. And everyone had solar clotheslines. The solar clotheslines clothes for you younger people are just regular clotheslines. We didn't have clothes dryers. In the wintertime, the clothes would freeze, and before you got the clothes pins onto the line, your hands would be so cold and so red. And I've been there. I went through that. Even into the 1950s and 1960s in our area, there was no fresh fruit. Uh, our fresh vegetables in the grocery stores in the wintertime on a regular basis, even in the summertime sometimes, not even on a regular basis. And uh, a lot of us should write these things down for the young kids today. People did, uh, had milk delivered to their doors if they didn't have their own cows. They would uh, stop by a farmer and buy uh, fresh eggs, or a farmer would have a route, and he would go down the road and sell his eggs. My father-in-law did that in the 1960s. He took the eggs down to Jeffersonville, and he had a little route that all these people in the subdivisions wanted this, these fresh eggs. We didn't have supermarkets until much later. Everybody would preserve their own food by canning, salting, or drying, and some people still do that today. Uh, you'd butcher your own animals. You'd sugar cure. You'd salt, you'd can in jars, and then later when there were freezers, you could freeze it. But uh, it's amazing how much has that we have progressed just since the 1950s. And I used to hear people say that that are older than I am, and I'd think, oh, what a stupid statement. But it's the truth. We have really progressed a lot. Today, we can buy anything in the supermarkets that we want any time of year. 
One thing I'll, I hadn't planned to tell you, but when I was young, before we would come to, that was in the 50s and 60s, before we'd come to Scottsburg from NAB, if mom said we've got to go to Scottsburg for something, if we had on shorts, we had to go change to skirts. We did not come to Scottsburg in shorts, not even as kids. You just, that just was not proper. And uh, I didn't start doing that, coming to Scottsburg in shorts, until 1965. And finally my husband said, oh, don't worry about changing your clothes. But uh, it's just a way of life. Weather conditions. I thought I'd give you a little bit about how our weather is, uh, was years ago, and we'll just see that things haven't changed a whole lot. March 1882, cloudy weather for the past few days, which resulted in a refreshing shower last night. They were needing rain. May 1882, lots of rain. The farmers can't get into their fields. Well, we know how that is, too. 1918, there's a deep snowstorm. Children walked on the fence post to school. I'm sure a lot of you have heard those stories. July 1952, no rain yet. Crops are suffering now. Some have begun to mow their soybeans for hay, and there will be no beans, and the leaves will soon be burned up. By having ponds, most everyone has plenty of water for which we are most thankful. Those people were really getting worried. May 1955, we are having lots of rain, and right now we are having dogwood winter and living by fast time, so maybe we can have time to sit by the fire some. That was in 1955, and they had fast and they had slow time. Some of the pioneers that you all have descended from, there was uh, James Anderson that bought land there, here in 1816. Francis McGuire purchased his in 1820, along with William Jones, Thomas Collins, Samuel Beach, and Solomon Beach. 1821, Thomas Brody, or Brody, James Stark, George Gardner, Abraham Ritchie, David Huckleberry, and Benjamin Collins. 1822, William Hobbs purchased his land. 1835, John Mount, and 1836, James Dean. John C. Finley is the namesake for the township, and he owned a large amount of land about a mile west of Leota. He purchased his in 1837. He purchased his, uh, as you'll see on paperwork back there, as the handouts in several different years. His wasn't purchased all at the same time. Later, Dr. John Ritchie purchased his land in 1856. John Mount, father of Matthias Mount, was married in 1822 in Scott County. We don't know the date that he purchased his ground, but we do assume now that uh, Matthias Mount was born here in Scott County and probably right there around Leota. Dr. John Ritchie and his wife were married in what is now Scott County in 1811. They survived the Pigeon Roost Massacre and settled in the old, I mean, Ox Creek area and raised 15 children. Some aliens is what they were called. They were immigrants. But in all the records you'll find are called aliens. Living in Finley Township in the 1800s was Charles, Mary, and Godfrey Autine and I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that name right, from Germany. Alex Campbell was from Ireland. Jack Inneman from Germany. Alexander Gamble, Ireland. Hiram Hamelman, Germany. Barbara and Randolph, Randolph Coons, Germany. George and Mary Nichols, Prussia, Germany. Anna B., Jacob and Ralph Runes, Switzerland. Caroline and William Schneck, Württemberg, Germany. Anthony Scholl, Prussia, Germany, John Shirley, Württemberg, Germany, John Wilson, Finland. These immigrants in the 19th century left their native lands to come here to escape poverty, bitterness, intolerance, oppression, even famine. Mostly, they brought to their adopted country little except courage, determination, and hope. Others brought something more, precious skills, talents, and science, music, art, and other fields. Several of the, these people have evidently moved on, as I know of no descendants from some of these surnames. But we can see why they chose Finley Township, especially the ones from Germany and Switzerland. This land lays similar to Germany and Switzerland, the hills and the valleys and all, 
And so they knew how to take care of that type of ground. So that's the type of country they'd want to live in again and make them feel more at home. Some of the surnames of families living in Finley today are Applegates, Brody, Chamberlain, Comer, Dean, Elliott, Kelly, McGuire, Minor, Mount, Pros, Richies, Robbins, Rose, Shields, Shirley, Strauss, Yunt, and many more. Now you will find, as I told you earlier, about these uh, uh, patents of the land that is back there. And you can pick up as many as you want and take them with you. There's different ones in the stack. I also have some information about the Applegate family with me in case there was any descendants here from them. And I will just give them this uh, register if they would like it. And we have several pictures of uh, various uh, pioneers that were back there, uh, that were in Finley Township. And I'll just take those out and pass those around in a few minutes. And if anybody wants them, you can take them home with you. They're just copies of pictures. We do have a plat in 1889, a Finley Township out of an atlas. And it, there's a lot more people there than I realized when I got to looking at it. Uh, besides the Richies, uh, there's Close, Carlisle, Mount, Gamble, uh, McCulloch, and there's a whole bunch of these. And I'll just let people look at that also. But do you know what diseases were so terrible back in years ago? Now we have all these shots that we can take to prevent us from getting so many diseases, like in 1918, the flu, the true influenza that killed so many people. Uh, in 1882, there was an article in the newspaper that said, the whooping cough is rough on the children of Scott County and scarlet rash. That would have been scarlet fever. <clears throat> 1901, pneumonia was killing people frequently. In the Chronicle, March the 21st, 1901, John F. Ritchie died on Wednesday night of last week at his home near Leota of pneumonia. He was only about 40 years old. He leaves a wife and several children. In 1901, Sarah Crum died one day last week at Leesville of asthma, age 76. Her remains were brought here Friday and buried at Clark's Chapel. I found that interesting. I'm assuming Leesville is the one that's in Jackson County, and I thought that was quite a ways to bring her in 1901 back down here to Barrier. 1918 was the influenza outbreak with many people dying of pneumonia that they caught while they had the flu. In 1938, epidemics of whooping cough and mumps in children, influenza in adults, and of course we know little Leota died of diphtheria. I'm very thankful for the vaccinations we can have today. Other things that was going on in uh, Finley Township was January the 1st in 1882. James P. Bailey of Finley Township served as president of the Sunday School Convention. Did you know there was a Sunday School Convention going on? It was reported that all of the schools are in good working order and they are increasing in number as well as interest. Taken from the Chronicle on March the 23rd, 1882, Ezekiel Clark, an aged resident of Finley Township, died on Friday and was buried on Saturday of last week. Now that, see, may be the only type of obituary you may find on your family. P.H. Overman went to Louisville a short time since and had one of his eyes taken out. Now the site is returning to his other eye. I thought that was interesting. Reverend Connor will preach at the Methodist Episcopal Church two weeks from tomorrow because they wouldn't always have services every week like we do now. It was when they would have a minister to come. Elder Thomas Jones of the Christian Church will preach at schoolhouse number nine, the fourth Sunday in the month. Now see, that's another place besides the home for a church to be held. Taken from the Chronicle, Thursday, March the 30th, 1882, Thomas Perrin will leave this vicinity in a few days for the far west. Many people traveled on west to new places to find new property and new jobs. Taken from the Chronicle on May 18th, 1882, there will be plenty of apples in Clark's Chapel neighborhood. Jasper Mitchell is lying at the point of death. The disease is unknown. Sometimes they would put in the newspaper that somebody was lying at the point of death, and then they didn't die. But uh, they just 
have a little note that they rallied. Jeff Pounds, who met with a severe accident the other day, is now slowly recovering. Thursday, May the 25th in 1882, P.H. Overman has gone to the city to have his eyes doctored. Salmon Perrin, who went out to Knox County not long since to work, has returned home. He says out there one is expected to work 25 hours a day and Sunday for a good count. They worked him too hard. He came back. Taken from the Scott County Journal on April the 26, 1951, 4-H and FFA teams win judging contests. The general livestock team composed of Ronald Robbins, Glenn Comer, Delbert Hurt, and Francis Brody placed sixth. May 5, 1955. Mr. and Mrs. Charles Crom Cromwell of Danville were Saturday overnight guests of Mr. and Mrs. Vern Trueblood. As you have heard, the various news in these past years can be sad, comical, or serious. The last article I would like to read to you is as follows. A young widow commissioned a monument cutter to inscribe on her husband's tombstone. My sorrow is more than I can bear. Before the work was finished, the widow married again and the cutter asked her if she still wanted the inscription she says yes but just add the word alone <laughs> I <thought> that <laughs> some of the politicians in Scott County were in 1882 A.D. Brody was a candidate for the sheriff on the Republican ticket uh, also in 1882 elected Mount for trustee and gardener for assessor by a handsome majorities, the remainder of the ticket was carried by Democrats. Frank Gardner uh, it was a, a resident of Finley Township, and he was a pretty famous politician. He was a representative from Indiana, born on a farm in Finley Township in 1872, to William and Eliza J. Ray Gardner, attended the rural schools, was a graduate from Borden Institute in Clark County, in 1896 and from the Law Department of the University of Indiana at Bloomington in 1900, was admitted to the bar in 1900 and commenced the practice of law in Scottsburg. Auditor of Scott County from 1903 to 1911, county attorney from 1911 to 1917, a member of the Democratic County Committee and served as chair chairman 1912 to 1922, served as a field examiner for the State Board of Accounts, 1911 to 1920, elected as a Democrat to the 68th, 69th, and 70th Congresses, which were in March 4th, 1923 to 1929, an unsuccessful candidate for re-election re in 1928, resumed the practice of law after he lost his election in Scottsburg, he was elected judge of the 6th Judicial Circuit of Indiana in 1930, re-elected in 36th, and ser served until his death in Scottsburg. He married a Bertha A. Warner in 1908. He was a Presbyterian. These things were often told what religion you were. And died February the 1st, 1937, and was buried in Scottsburg Cemetery. We also have Billy Comer. He has served as a county commissioner for numerous years in Scott County, and he's still living today, which we're glad to say. <laughs> uh, Robert Shields once owned the Leota store, and he built a garage in the hillside with a tunnel leading to his house on the hill. The reason he built this tunnel, everybody always was wondering why he had this tunnel in this hillside to his house. But Anna May Kelly told me, he had trouble backing his car, so he built a turntable into the garage. And when he parked in the garage, he could turn the turntable, and he was headed out, so he didn't have to back out. So that was the reason for his tunnel to the house, because he could just go straight into the house from there. From the old Ox Minute records. Now, some of this that I'm going to tell you here that's in these church records, They'd kick you out if you weren't doing the way you were supposed to or the way they thought you were supposed to. And uh, I tried to be careful with which ones I brought up and which ones, uh, what their sins were. But from Old Ox Minute records, 
They show how people were kicked out of the church. For instance, December 1826, Jonathan Stark laid in grievance against James Stark and wife for separating. Laid over, which meant tabled until the next meeting. January the 27th, 1827, declared James and Polly Stark no more of us. So they kicked them out. In September 26, 1829, whereas there is reports circulating in this world that brother Zacchaeus Sutton attended a late shooting match, shoot for a prize, which if through causes grief, I'm reading this the way they had written it, to his brethren in the church, appointed Deacon Joshua Kelly to call on Brother Sutton and request him to attend our next meeting. They were going to lay him out. October 1829, Brother Zacchaeus Sutton came forward and confessed his wrong in shooting at a shooting match, and the church restored him to his standing in the church. That's all you had to do is just state you were wrong. Whereas a hardness exists now between Brother Joshua Kelly and Brother Sutton, the church labored with them on the subject without effect. A spirit of hardness existed between them. Laid over to the next meeting. The church voted that they were satisfied with Brother Joshua Kelly for lending his gun to Jonathan Johnson. November the 18th, 1829, Brother Sutton and Brother Kelly settled their difficulty between themselves and the church is satisfied. It took them a while, but they made up. April 1886, a vote was to take up feet washing again, which has been neglected for some time. January 1891, James Grammer and T.J.M. Mount are taken before the church for joining a secret order. Oh, my. Grammer is excluded and Mount promises to leave the order. Finley Township Fire Department is one of the organizations in Finley Township. The Leota Frolic is, began in 1983 and continues in each August. It includes arts and crafts booths. Well, they have a great time. I have been told that the old scale shed for the old Leota canning factory is used as a place to sell ice cream during the festival. Is that still true? That's great. I'm, I'm pleased with that. 